Hi, Pete Wadgen here from Next Level Wealth. I'm just at home today in Noosa. Uh, I've been reading lots of stuff about Labour's negative gearing changes and all of the um, uh, impacts and possible impacts of that. So they've set a drop dead date now, 1 January 2020. So today, I'm going to run through all the impacts and possible impacts and what you need to do about it. Uh, it's a free workshop. The whole thing should be done in about one hour. So let's get straight into it. So my big promise for today is a completely free tutorial. And if you stick around to the end, there'll be a free book for download as well. So just a very brief uh, bit about me first. As you can hear, Englishman by birth. Um, so we've actually been through uh, changes to landlord tax deductibility before over in London. Uh, the world kept turning. Uh, there's a lot of panic about what it might or might not do. Uh, but what you do see is some behavioral change. So I'm going to shed some light on that. Today, I've been talking about some of these things in the mainstream media for some years anyway, uh, but now we've got some definite dates in place so we can actually start to talk about uh, what strategies you can put in place uh, to make sure you're best positioned. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping first, as you can hear, I'll be speaking in an English accent, probably uh, had too much coffee, so I'll be talking a bit quickly at times as well, so you'll have to keep up. and. Um, now there is some jargon because we're talking about tax changes after all, but what I'll try to do is keep everything in plain English uh, to the extent possible as well. And uh, where there's some benefit to me doing so, I might just add a bit of graffiti to the slides as well. Uh, so let's go. So what happens next? So the Labour Party has now confirmed that from 1 January 2020, uh, they're going to change their rules on negative gearing. Um, so it will still be available on new properties prospectively going forward. Um, people who are already uh, invested, no impact on them directly, although the market dynamics might change a bit. And for people investing in established property after 1 January 2020, the tax rules have changed. Um, so what we're going to cover off today is, well, why are you investing in property in the first place? What are you trying to achieve? Secondly, well, what do you need to invest in going forward if you still want to be a property investor? And thirdly, we're just going to look at how some of the strategies that you might put in place. And a final consideration as well is timing, because um, it's still possible to do things prior to 1 January 2020 um, if you've got your ducks in a row. Uh, but if you do, um, if you're going to invest after 1 January 2020, the, the things that you do might be slightly different. So we're going to cover all of that today. Um, in this workshop, let's do it. Now, if you think back to 2018, I did a work paper or a report with a group called Riskwise Property Research, and they did some amazing modeling uh, to show the likely impacts of Labour's changes across all of the SA4 regions around Australia. They did it by property type, so they looked at houses and units. Um, so it's the best modeling by far that's been done on this subject. Now, at that time, we talked about um, prices being lower lower than otherwise would be the case by a fair margin across all states uh, some sa4 regions impacted more than others as you, as you might expect now one of the questions that comes to light now is to some extent have some of these price declines already been priced in and the answer is in some areas yes um, because ultimately what you need to see under labor's rules is that rental yields have to be uh, depending on the area, they probably have to be around about 1% higher. So CoreLogical released its latest figures this week, and they will show that rental yields have increased quite significantly, um, mainly due to price declines more, than, more so than rents, but they still haven't increased enough. Um, so some areas, there's still some further downturn to come before the market rebalances. Uh, so stick around because we're going to cover uh, through this workshop, uh, firstly, the possible impacts, Secondly, where the opportunities arise, and thirdly, some of the risk areas as well. Now, a second dynamic to watch out for. Uh, so in recent years, there's a lot of talk about rising interest rates globally, uh, particularly in the US. And so interest rates were hiked off the zero lower bound. Um, and for a time, it looked as though interest rates were just going to keep rising until something breaks. Um, well, that dynamic is now reversed. So a bit of jargon here. Uh, the yield curve in the US is now inverted. Um, so in plain English, uh, the market is no longer expecting to see further hikes from the Fed in the US. And this can be good news for Australian property. Uh, so funding costs 
Um, as you can see, this chart is a very oversimplified uh, chart um, showing that the cost of money um, for Australian banks um, had, had increased quite significantly in 2018 to the extent that banks were having to pass on interest rate hikes to their mortgage borrowers. Um, but that, those funding costs, the pressure on funding costs has just dropped away very dramatically. And in fact, uh, pretty much back in, in line with long run averages now. Um, so uh, the, the rising interest rate story has gone away. Uh, so that's one of the dynamics to watch out for as 2019 rolls on. And we'll look at a bit more uh, on the next slide in terms of what the Reserve Bank is expected to do as well. So financial markets are now pricing that the Reserve Bank uh, will have to cut interest rates twice more uh, by 2020. And that's partly to do with the housing downturn itself. It's putting a lot of pressure on consumption in the economy, it's damaging confidence. Uh, construction is now falling away very sharply. We've seen 50,000 construction jobs shared over the year to February. Uh, so what does that mean for you and me? Uh, well, check out with your local lender because fixed rates uh, should now be falling. So we saw Macquarie Bank go in the past week. Uh, Suncorp has gone as well. Um, so uh, particularly on three-year fixed rates and five-year fixed rates, you'll see mortgage rates should be now coming down. Um, now, there's a big hurdle for the interest rates from the Reserve Bank to be cut. They don't want to cut rates. Uh, they might be pressured into it. Um, but I, should, I would caution that even if the Reserve Bank cuts interest rates by 25 or 50 basis points, so half a percent, it doesn't necessarily follow that the lenders will pass on these cuts to variable rates because uh, banks are going to be trying to protect their profits. Um, so I don't know anything about your personal situation, um, but I suspect that um, there might be some pretty good fixed rate mortgage deals coming up over the next year. Uh, variable rates, you may well see that banks don't pass on cuts, even if they happen. Um, so speak to your mortgage broker, speak to your financial planner uh, about fixed mortgage rates. Another thing to watch out for is whether interest only loans become more widely available again. There was a big clamp down on interest only loans over the past couple of years. I think if regulators um, uh, see, have seen some sense, this should now stabilise, uh, because if that doesn't happen, uh, then the impact of Labour's changes will be magnified. So I suspect that just very quietly with not much fanfare, and it will mainly be through mortgage broker channels, uh, banks will just start to bring back their interest-only loan products. And in fact, uh, I've seen a bit of um, uh, stuff from Westpac this week, um, just quietly um, angling for new business, cash rebates for new loans from, uh, from, from other banks, bringing those across. And um, pretty tempting interest only rates as well. So I suspect that we've probably been through the squeeze now and people will start to just gradually be able to get interest only loans again. If they can't, uh, look out because then the impact of Labour's changes will be magnified. And a third trend to watch out for is that we've been through this period of very rapid um, housing construction across all the major capital cities, lots of high rise apartments. It was largely funded by Chinese investors from the Chinese mainland, uh, but also uh, super funds and some mum and dad investors too. Uh, so now we're going to see that go into reverse. And in fact, if you look over the past year, uh, particularly Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, um, building approvals have just plummeted. Um, and we're not just talking about building approvals, by the way, there's uh, projects being mothballed and cancelled and stalled or going insolvent. Um, so all of those cranes that we've seen in inner city Brisbane and all the way across Sydney, they're starting to come down now. Uh, so over 2019, as the year rolls on, you can expect to see the construction pipeline just getting smaller and smaller. Um, so that's one of the ways in which the market rebalances. The supply of rental housing uh, now just shrinking away uh, because these things are a cycle. It's a uh, key point to remember. Uh, governments come and go, tax, tax laws change. But things always go in a cycle, and now we're going to see um, a lot of um, the pipeline just shrinking away until eventually there'll be upwards pressure on rents again. But it does take time, especially in Sydney, because we've still got this overhang of new apartments to work through. Uh, but population growth is really, really high in Melbourne, um, so you might see the supply holds up a bit better there. Uh, 120,000 in Greater Melbourne. Uh, Sydney's growing at about 95,000. And Brisbane, about 50,000, so a fourth year of increases there too. 
And those three cities, um, you'll see the construction pipeline shrinking, but a lot of people are still moving in. Um, so that's another dynamic to watch out for as 2019 rolls on. So these are the big questions that uh, mum and dad property investors need to ask themselves. Number one, uh, why are you even investing in property in the first place? Because you do always have to weigh up other opportunities. Uh, so in Australia, uh, tax incentives generally push people towards property or the stock market. Uh, so people need to consider, uh, well, why property? Is it still right for you? Um, but in particular, post 1 January 2020, um, have a think about You've got to look at cash flow. That's the big thing. Um, so assuming you can still get interest on the mortgages, uh, you don't want to be racking up big net rental losses. It's not going to be much use to you on established property. I will show um, in this presentation why new property, although Labour is trying to steer people into it, it will still be an inferior investment. And I think people will work this out pretty quickly because you pay a premium to buy brand new. That's the developer's profit. Uh, when you come to sell, the property is no longer new, so it's lost that newness premium. And then when you come to sell, of course, the next person doesn't have access to those tax incentives that you've had. And so the property, unfortunately, will have fallen in value and people will lose money. Uh, so that's why I don't think Labour's uh, incentives are going to generate new housing supply in the same way that they think. And they'll probably have to look towards uh, institutional funds, uh, so build to rent ideas for affordable housing. Um, but the best investment is still going to be an established property. But you've got to think quite carefully about how does that cash flow work for you, um, because you don't want to be generating net rental losses if you can't use them against other forms of income. Um, and you also need to weigh up um, when do you take action. So do you try and lock in an investment before 1 January, or do you sit back and wait for the opportunities to arise because there will be some. Now, there's no one size fits all when it comes to uh, investments and particularly with property. Uh, so one of the things I've seen with my clients is um, a lot of people have businesses in a trust or they have a family trust. And uh, the changes that Labour has proposed um, uh, on trusts, uh, the impact is, is a lot less. Um, so there will be a change to market dynamics. But most of what Labour's um, changes are, are going to be targeted at is actually mum and dad investors in their own names offsetting net rental losses against their salary. That's the big change. So for a lot of people, it might not be as direct a change as um, you might think. Another uh, thing which is uh, very badly explained, generally speaking, is that um, you can still offset net rental losses from established property if you have other investment income. So I already mentioned the stock market. So if you've got dividend income from shares, uh, your net rental losses may still be used in some circumstances. Now, just a disclaimer here, I don't know anything about your personal circumstances, so you need to speak to your financial advisor. Um, but um, negative gearing and net rental losses on established property, they may not go completely unused. It all comes down to your personal circumstances and what other investment income you might have. Otherwise, they might be carried forward. So you need to think pretty carefully about that. Uh, for people who don't have access to other funds or other investments, then they may still in invest in established property. But in one way or another, they're going to have to improve the yield. So for some people, that might mean looking at Brisbane or Adelaide instead of Sydney and Melbourne, because the yields are higher. Uh, even on um, established houses, it's not very difficult to find 5 or 6% yields depending on where you're looking. And if you want to uh, get high yield still, it's not that difficult, but you might need to look further from the center of the city or at townhouses or units. Uh, there are lots of different ways that people can easily generate a high yield. And don't forget mortgage rates now available from in the threes, maybe 4%. Uh, so you don't need a particularly high yield to make a break even result, but it all comes down to your personal circumstances. Um, now the, um, if you read in The Australian this week, great article by Stuart Weems, who's a good financial planner and mortgage broker and a guy that really understands property. And he talks about some of the strategies that landlords should use in terms of making sure they maximise their rental return. Um, so I'm not saying you should do short stay lets, or um, but you might have shorter tenancies, for example, for regular rental reviews, um, or you could improve the facilities available for tenants. There are lots of things that people might do improve improve the rental yield 
you just need to think about your personal situation. If you've got a dud property uh, already, it's still going to be a dud under the new rules. Uh, so it might be a time to divest. Um, but if you're looking to invest post 1 January 2020 in established properties, you just got to have a think about how does the yield work for you? Um, the alternative is wait for a bit of a correction and find opportunities as they arise because some landlords will be spat out of the market and um, the opportunities will come around and things do eventually rebalance. So I already mentioned other investment income. Uh, so this is just a very, um, this is a, just a snapshot. This is my, as at March 2019. It shows that it's not that hard if you need other investment income to find a good uh, dividend yield on Australian stocks. Now, a massive disclaimer across this, I'm not for one second recommending that you go and invest in the highest yielding stock, because in some of these cases, it's quite clear to see uh, that the yield is high because the market uh, doesn't um, see the outlook for that company or business as particularly hot. And in some cases, their products or services may be becoming obsolete. Uh, so uh, for the, um, you must go and see a financial planner before you do anything in the stock market. Uh, but what is quite clear to see is that it's not difficult to generate a decent dividend income. Uh, so, for example, in my case, during the Royal Commission, um, I picked up some shares in Commonwealth Bank in the mid 60s. And as of today in March, the dividend yield might be um, around about 6% and gross stuff is about 8.5%. Um, so, for people with a bit of spare cash and they need some investment income, it's not very difficult uh, to generate that. Uh, so if you've got a property that's making a net rental loss uh, going forward post 1 January 2020 of a few thousand dollars per annum, it's really not that difficult for people to generate uh, dividend income that they might use. Uh, but this is a case by case basis. But I would caution people, uh, don't fall for the yield trap and go and invest in something just because there's a double digit yield, uh, because you might find that it's uh, double digit for a good reason. So I talked about already um, different ways in which people might improve the yield. So this is just a very simple example of a house in Brisbane. Now, most of what we buy uh, for investors is generally stuff where you can improve the house in the future, so equity on ice. Uh, so the older type of property in uh, Brisbane uh, is typically the weatherboard or the Queenslander style house. The rental yields on those is generally pretty poor, um, usually because it's an older style property, uh, the value is all in the land. Uh, but it's not that hard if you want a 5% yield. Um, so uh, I think in this case, if you went out to about say, 10k radius from Brisbane, it's pretty easy to find a 5% yield or thereabouts. Um, and if you want more, of course, you can go into a more medium density style of housing. Uh, don't forget the depreciation. Uh, so under the existing rules, the coalition has already made changes on second-hand property for plant and equipment. But don't forget the structure depreciation. So there are two types of depreciation, Division 40 and 43. Um, so if, you, if you're buying something that's built post-1985, um, there's still plenty of depreciation that can be claimed. Um, but uh, this is where the rules will change post-1 January 2020. Because where that depreciation pushes your uh, the loss per year tax return into a big net rental loss position. Um, previously, you could easily offset that against your salary income, but things might be a bit different for you now. Uh, so there are different ways to improve the yield, and don't forget the depreciation component. Um, but this is where you just need to think a little bit about how a change in tax rules uh, might just change your investment approach slightly. So um, what I've done here is I've pulled up um, a very, very basic example of a house in Brisbane. The purchase price is about $550,000. Um, so let's have a look at how it works under the current tax rules. So what we've assumed here is a 20% deposit, an interest only mortgage at 4.19%, which is pretty realistic. Uh, rental, re rental yield of about 4.7%, so that's about $500 per week. And I've made a few assumptions on capital growth at three and a half percent, a moderate uh, increase in the rents, and a marginal tax rate of about, say, 37 percent, which is uh, where um, a lot of Aussies would sit in terms of their marginal tax rate. 
So if you were to purchase that type of property, you might need to set aside about 20,000 or a little bit more for the closing costs. So you've got to pay your stamp duty. Um, now we're assuming here that we're under the land tax threshold um, as you would be. Um, and you'll have other closing costs like legal fees and you most likely would have a building and pest report. So give or take 22,000 or so for closing costs plus your deposit. Uh, so that is a, a pretty normal, shall we say, type of house in Brisbane. Let's say it's about 10K radius from the CBD. Uh, so nothing uh, complex here. Let's just have a look at how those numbers work under today's rules. So here you can see, um, if you're borrowing money at um, 4.2% or thereabouts, now I've assumed here an interest only mortgage. Uh, so you might find if it's a five year interest only product, in year five, you have to start repaying principal unless you're able to refinance. So, um, but let's just set aside that point for now. Uh, so $500 or thereabouts per week, you're generating in rental income of about $26,000. Uh, your mortgage is gonna cost you a bit less than 20,000 per annum. You always have with uh, real estate, there is um, a lot of holding costs that you need to account for. So property management fees, you'll have rates and water to pay for. Um, you might have, um, well, you certainly would have building and landlord insurance. Uh, so you'd be looking at, in Brisbane, you'd be looking at flood free locations, unless you like paying insurance and having uh, sleepless nights. Uh, but you should also account for things like uh, repairs that come up every year and maintenance, uh, but also maybe a couple of weeks per annum vacancy. So as you can see under the existing rules, if you assume uh, no plant and equipment depreciation, and uh, I should say this is a very, a dumbed down or oversimplified example, but let's just go with it. Um, let's uh, say you can claim about 4,000 per annum, uh, which is at the, the low to medium end of the range for a relatively modern home. And um, what you would see is that um, your cash flow will be give or take, it won't be far off break even. But under the existing rules, that depreciation allows you to put a, a nice tasty net rental loss on your tax return. So effectively after tax, um, it's not very difficult, uh, even here with a 4.7% rental yield, to be in a positive cash flow position after tax. So I don't think people really understand this point in terms of uh, you can be negatively geared, but in a positive cash flow situation, even without trying that hard, let's face it. Uh, so this is on a 20% deposit. So this is where the rules change on established property. Because if you're generating a net rental loss, on an established property after January 2020. Um, even in this case, it's not that big a loss, but you still want to either uh, have a way to use that or else it's going to get carried forward. Um, so this is where people might look at just re, just tweaking their strategy slightly. You either have to look for a higher rental yield, you need some way in which you can use that loss so it's not just sitting there unused way into the future. Or you just need to maybe adjust the financing. There's any number of things you might do, uh, but it's really just about having an awareness. And as you can see, um, it doesn't take much in terms of changes in financing costs or changes in rental yields, which I think is what will happen before the market finds a new equilibrium. Uh, but people just need to think a bit more smartly about what they're doing and not just racking up losses uh, lazily without thinking about it, uh, because that's just dead money out the door. Um, so yeah, just um, this is just a very simplified example. Big disclaimer here: um, it's not a these aren't real numbers, but they're pretty close to a, a realistic example. And um, yeah, you just need to look at it on a case by case basis. A crap property is still going to be a dud investment, and a good property is still going to be a good investment. But you just need to make the cash flow work for you and make sure that it's tax efficient. Now, one of the things that I mentioned earlier in the piece is that we went through some changes in Britain to landlord deductibility, mainly hit, impacted people at the higher rate brackets. Uh, there's a lot of panic through the real estate industry. Um, is it going to completely shatter the rental market? Well, no, the world kept turning, uh, but what we did see was some behavioural change. And we had changes to stamp duty brackets as well, and that pushed some people into the lower price brackets, uh, sub 900k. Uh, rents increased in some areas as the rental supply uh, declined. What we did find is that the market finds its new level and the world keeps turning. Um, but that said, it's not a reason to be complacent. And it's probably the perfect time, in fact, uh, to 
reset your strategy and just work out what it is you're trying to achieve. And um, there will be some opportunities that come up too, but just, you just don't want to get caught napping, that's all. And I've talked about some of this stuff for a number of years now in the mainstream media over in uh, Britain um, and in Australia in the Australian newspapers. You can track back some of those media pieces. Um, but in particular, we did a very in-depth report on negative gearing with risk-wise property research. Um, so that was uh, mainly for Instos, that report. but. Um, We've done a lot of work on it um, and we're pretty confident that um, there will be an impact from Labour's changes. Um, so you just need to make sure you've positioned yourself correctly. So just to summarise that first section then, uh, there will be some risks coming up for the market uh, because one way or another those rental yields have to go up. Uh, so that means there's going to be some risks um, and particularly for certain types of property. So if you're invested in um, some of those apartment towers with a high concentration of investors, for example, uh, there's there's going to be some uh, risks for secondhand property. Um, but the thing is that, um, as I mentioned, uh, the demand for housing remains very strong. Uh, so there, there will be some opportunities come up as well. Some people will panic and sell. Some people won't be able to sustain uh, their strategies. And uh, the supply of rental uh, housing and established property is going to be constricted. Uh, so there'll be some opportunities too. So uh, I guess um, just to make the point there, it's about having an awareness and just being ready to strike. So if you want to um, experience ongoing success from your real estate investment, then the key point is um, it can still be done, but you might just need to tweak your strategy. Uh, most people in my experience invest in real estate for uh, ultimately because they want to build a level of financial independence that will give them time freedom down the track. Uh, that can still be done, um, but you just need to think quite carefully about your tax position. Um, now, this uh, is a case by case basis, it's different for different people, um, but um, the tax changes will lead to behavioural change. You just want to make sure you're on the right side of that trade. So, I do a uh, 12 month coaching program, and what I've I've uh, been sharing with people is that we're coming into a quite a landscape change here uh, for real estate investment. There was a big orgy of investment as people piled in chasing the capital gains. That's what happens in every cycle. Uh, the um, regulators stepped in. Uh, we're now seeing um, making it much harder for investors if they don't service up when they come to apply for a mortgage. Uh, so the landscape has already changed. It's going to keep changing now all the way through into 2020. Um, so that's what I've been spending most of my time working on, is just making sure that people are positioned correctly. So one of the uh, key takeaways is that life's been pretty easy for capital city, real estate investors over the past decade or so. Um, it's been pretty easy. You buy, you renovate, you hold the property. Uh, if you've got a bit of a net rental loss, people haven't worried about that too much um, because the capital growth is easily compensated. Uh, there's a bit of a tax benefit anyway for people. Um, but what I'm saying is uh, that strategy has been really effective, um, especially in some of the big capital cities in recent years. Um, but what got you uh, to this point is not going to get you to where you want to get to in the future. Um, so let's take a look at a few of the uh, changes in strategy you might deploy. So 30 second recap. So the coalition has already made changes to depreciation um, under Division 40. Um, so plant, secondhand uh, plants and equipment, uh, those deductions have now changed on uh, established property. Um, so already at the margins there's been these tweaks, and that's reduced uh, people's net rental losses for new investors. Um, travel expenses are already disallowed, and um, the, the regulator has made it much harder for people to, to own multiple properties. Um, so uh, there's a practice guide called a bit of jargon alert, APG223, essentially said um, that um, serviceability, people will be stress tested at at least 7% and probably quite a bit above. It doesn't matter if you're borrowing at 3.5% or 4%, you still need to be able to prove serviceability at a higher level. Plus, um, banks, uh, if people are borrowing more than six times their income in aggregate, uh, banks are going to have to look at that pretty closely before writing a loan. So um, whereas people once were able to pile up um, 
use their equity to buy properties again and again and again. Uh, that's now much harder to do. Um, so that's uh, that's all in the rear view mirror anyway, but it will continue to impact people going forward. Uh, but now we've got some new changes on top of this uh, from proposed by the Labour Party. So Labour's been in, ahead in the polls for a long time. I think they'll probably win the election. Um, franking credit refunds will impact some investors. That's outside the scope of what we'll talk about today. Uh, most people won't be impacted by that, uh, but some uh, retirees and lower income earners might be. Uh, what we're going to look at today is um, the negative gearing changes and the capital gains tax changes. So CGT, um, I think for most property investors, uh, real estate is usually worth better as a long-term investment anyway because of the stamp duty, uh, the cost of selling, um, the cost of acquiring property, the cost to get in and out are quite high anyway. And um, if you add in the capital gains tax, you generally find that the best investments are those that have been held for a longer period of time. Uh, so if you're not getting the capital gains tax discount from 1 January 2020, I mean, that really just reinforces the importance of a, a, a medium to longer term uh, holding period. And you might see some asset lock in uh, because who wants to uh, give back all of their gains in capital gains tax? Certainly not me. Uh, now, negative gearing, um, the rules that have been proposed, um, we've already talked about. So net rental losses on established property not being used against your salary income. Now, will Labour get those changes through, uh, effective 1 January 2020? Um, they're not going to have a majority in the Senate, I would expect. Uh, so they're going to need some crossbench support to get those rules through, or they might be watered down. Uh, but they won't need much support. So let's work on the assumption that those rules are fully implemented from 1 January 2020. Um, so um, it's not a guaranteed thing at this point in time. We've still got a budget. We've still got an election. They're always closed. But let's work on the assumption that Labour does push forward with these proposals. And let's see what happens. So a lot of uh, stuff to digest here in a one hour workshop. So let's just take a 30 second breather uh, so I can have a cup of uh, coffee as well. And if you've just had a moment there uh, to consider what we've talked about so far, let's get into the second part of the presentation where we'll talk about uh, some of the strategy changes and some of the other impacts as well from Labour's proposals. So the tax office um, released its 2017 figures this week. And what it showed is that 90% uh, of landlords uh, only ever own uh, one to two properties. So um, more than one and a half million uh, landlords have an interest in just one rental property and 90% have just one or two. Uh, so what the Labour Party is saying, what's the target? So these people, uh, people who've been using the tax benefits to get six or more properties, uh, but as you can see, it's actually not that many people when you look at it. Uh, 20,000 or so um, in each given tax year, increasing very slowly. Um, so what you can see from this is that, one, most people don't achieve what they want to from real estate. Most people never own more than one or two rentals, which probably isn't enough on its own to get people where they want to get to. Uh, so there's not many professional landlords, as you can see. Uh, now, Labour wants to change that, so they're going to bring in more institutional investors in time, I guess. Um, but this is um, both a good and a bad thing. So it's a pretty um, imperfect market. So it's not that hard to find good opportunities that will outperform. Uh, so a lot of it's common sense, as I always say in real estate. Most of it, probably 90% is common sense. But as you can see, uh, most people never actually achieve what they want to. So most people don't do it right. Um, so this is uh, the backdrop. Uh, relatively few people owning multiple properties. Um, it's become a bit harder too in recent years because of the changes to lending standards, uh, but it can still be done. So let's take a look at how. So it's pretty clear then that the old way uh, people just buying properties on 3% rental yields. Um, I mean, that's fine for people who, who are invested before the change uh, because uh, they're uh, tax benefits will be grandfathered in perpetuity. They'll never go away. Uh, so it's, it's an intergenerationally unfair policy in some ways because it benefits people like myself who are old enough to have invested before the change. But if you're looking beyond 1 January 2020, I've already mentioned a new property 
I mean, it's already statistically very risky because A, you don't know where you're buying if you buy off the plan. There are teething issues with new property. But most importantly, it's the price you pay to buy new. And when you come to resell, especially under the new rules, you will lose. Uh, but by the same token, buying established property and just racking up big rental losses, um, I caution people to be wary of vested interest saying they should just plow ahead and do it anyway. Um, because investing to, to make a loss is never really that smart. Um, it was not so bad if you could offset that loss against your salary. But if that's not the case going forward, um, you just want to really uh, be a bit more uh, canny about how you think about these things and just be a bit careful about people saying plow ahead regardless. Now, on the plus side, rental yields will rise now. Um, so some of that will come out in the wash over the next year or two. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, just um, advise people uh, case by case, look at your personal situation, uh, but just be a bit wary about uh, investing in property and making a loss uh, if you can't use that loss. So let's take a look. Um, mentioned we've been through a landscape change. You generally find um, real estate downturns last for two or three years. In Sydney, uh, the market peaked in February 2017. Uh, certainly did for those of us who were active on the ground at that time, just watching and observing what was happening. So Sydney is now uh, coming into its third year of downturn. And um, house prices have fallen pretty sharply, uh, detached housing, because that's uh, quite often uh, in places like Western and Southwestern Sydney. Attached dwellings, uh, by which that means uh, terraced housing, and um, townhouses and apartments and units. Uh, prices are down less steeply, um, partly because those properties are better located, um, a bit more homogenous as well. Um, but um, Sydney is now coming to its third year of downturn. Um, and as you can see, when uh, the initial macro prudential measures were introduced to slow down investor lending, there was an, an initial impact, and then banks got lending sharply again. Uh, and interest only loans fired up again. And then at this point, um, uh, the regulator had to step in again, uh, early 2017, and that, um, that has really just killed the cycle dead. Um, now, the thing you, you uh, learn in real estate is that there are the balancing and counterbalancing factors, and downturns never go on forever. Eventually, you reach a point where um, the uh, developers stop building, uh, there's pressure on rental markets again, and uh, now we're not at that point yet, and certainly not in Sydney, because there's still an overhang of new apartments. But eventually, rents start rising again, and people pour back into the market. But under this landscape change, there's going to be quite a significant change of behaviour now. And one of the unintended consequences is that people are going to redirect their borrowing capacity away from established rentals and into their place of residence. So. Um, for desirable A-grade stock, um, people are going to redirect all of their borrowing capacity into a place, a desirable place that they want to live. Um, so although the policy is designed to take pressure off house prices um, and level the playing field, there will be some unintended consequences. And in fact, you'll see in some areas, um, desirable house prices actually rising as people become owner occupiers and uh, leverage up into their place of residence where you still get a capital gains tax exemption. Uh, so the world is changing a bit from 1 January 2020. Uh, but I think the downturn has got a way to run in Sydney. Melbourne is about nine months behind on that uh, cycle, I guess. So we're starting to see some very low auction clearance rates in Melbourne at the moment. Uh, and eventually um, people will decide to pull up the ladder and stop listing new properties. That's happened in Sydney some months back now. Uh, so it's all part of the rebalancing process, but I think we've still got a way to go. Yeah, so that's the landscape change we've been through, and there's a bit more to come yet. Now, this is an important point that I've already touched on. Interest-only lending in Australia uh, became extremely popular. It already was for investors. Um, now, if you're not familiar, the interest-only mortgage means that you just pay back an interest charge, you don't have to pay back the principal, and certainly in the first five years of uh, the, the loan, depending on the terms. And this made perfect sense for investors. It's very tax efficient because you get a tax deduction um, for the interest component. Um, but also in Australia, it makes perfect sense because you can use a mortgage offset 
accounts, you can combine your savings and reduce the interest charge. So it's the perfect product for investors. Now, some um, home buyers have actually got in uh, on this act as well, which makes a lot less sense in my view. And um, as in, in two uh, in two strikes, essentially, the regulators really clamped down on the use of interest only lending. Uh, so there were caps put in place. Um, there was a mortgage rate differential. So you often paid a higher mortgage rate on interest only loans. Now, uh, I'm talking in March 2019. At this point in time, it seems to me like interest only loans will now level off um, in terms of the share of the market. Um, I saw uh, Westpac this week just angling for some new business at 4.19%, three years interest only. Um, so to me, that suggests that just at the margin, uh, things are just loosening up a little bit and they need to. Um, because if interest only loans aren't made available to investors, then the impact of Labour's changes will go from being a moderate change to uh, an amplified change. Uh, so hopefully there'll be some common sense applied. Um, we'll have to wait and see. I, th I don't think there'll be much fanfare. I think um, the, uh, the loosening will be mainly through mortgage broker channels and done very quietly to begin with. Uh, but my sense is just at the margin, uh, so ANZ and Westpac, they might just start to offer some more interest only loans, uh, particularly to investors now, not to owner occupiers. And um, this is very, very relevant to what happens to the market, because if interest only loans aren't made available, uh, then look out because um, a modest correction will, could turn into something much bigger. So let's see. Cool. So we've looked at a few ideas there. And so now we're going to look at what to do next. So this is the transformation I work on with my clients. We look at um, their situation to date and where they want to get to, and then just look at the new strategies that people need to use under the new tax system uh, to get to the goals and the time freedom that they desire. And one good thing that's uh, come out of this week is that now we've got a drop dead day. So we know there's a line in the sand from 1 January 2020, assuming Labour wins the election, uh, that's the, the data which the tax rules change. So um, while I don't think it's great policy, the good news is there's a little bit more clarity and certainty now in terms of dates, and people can at least start to work towards those new rules. Now, one of the things I noticed in uh, the tax stats that came out this week, I haven't updated the chart yet, is that uh, net rental losses on property, they've actually been falling now. They're at about the lowest level in nearly a decade and a half. Uh, so the average uh, net rental loss uh, got very big in Australia 2008 because we had high mortgage rates, uh, we had negative gearing rules in place. Uh, but since that time, mortgage rates have been falling and net rental losses. So on average, people are losing a few thousand dollars. So it's not too dramatic. In fact, that trend will continue beyond the latest stats which were available for 2017 because the coalition has changed its depreciation rules for plant and equipment. Uh, mortgage rates are now close to record lows. And um, there are actually just fewer investors in the market. And the rebalancing has actually already taken place. Uh, so as I mentioned, there'll be changes to other rental deductions. So we've got uh, changes to plant and equipment have already happened, changes to travel expenses. Um, Rents are now going to increase in some areas and some property types. In fact, it's already happening in parts of Melbourne. And rental interest deductions, as you can see, well, they've been pretty flat now for a number of years uh, because mortgage rates, if you shop around, and I'm, as I've mentioned already, if you look on some of those three and five year fixed mortgage rates, very, very attractive rates. So, um, so some of the uh, doom and gloom scenarios out there, there's a few counterbalancing factors. Um, because uh, markets have a way of rebalancing eventually, and some of that rebalancing has already happened. Now, this is a slide I've pulled up from a, a previous presentation, but just to uh, reiterate the point, I won't run a full case study today. It's just to note that in some of these middle age, uh, age brackets, uh, some people have been running up, especially in Sydney and Melbourne, very significant net rental losses. Now, not everyone was doing it, as you can see on the chart. Uh, but some people were racking up big net rental losses, and that's really something to be cautious of. If you can't use those losses 
uh, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars a rental loss. If you're not using it, um, I'll be a bit cautious about that because the old uh, theory was well, offset against your salary, uh, let the capital growth do the work. Uh, so those are the um, those are the sort of strategies that uh, you need to be a bit careful about. Uh, but as I said, it's case by case. Some people will have trust um, income, other people have other investment income. So you need to look at it in the context of your personal circumstances. Now, there's been a lot of doom and gloom around at the moment, as there tends to be. The economy has, has suffered from the credit squeeze. Uh, we've seen two quarters of pretty flat performance in the economy. Uh, house prices have been sliding. A lot of doom and gloom around. As I already mentioned, um, there are pretty easy ways in this country to generate um, decent positive income, and the tax incentives in this country generally push people towards the stock market or to real estate. Um, so, uh, but there are now limitless opportunities for people to package up their IP and generate business income as well. Um, so. I think um, while there's doom and gloom around for the time being, and there probably will be for the first uh, year of the Labour government too, uh, there's still uh, endless opportunities in Australia. So uh, you need to take a step back sometimes from some of the media reporting about the end of the world, uh, because that's not going away. Uh, but the reality is Australia is a land of massive opportunity. And uh, for people who actually have the right mentality, uh, there's endless opportunity out there to make money and positive income as well. Okay, so just before we go into the final section of the presentation, let's just take another uh, 20 seconds or so just to consider a few of those points. I've finished my drink as well. And if you've had a think about what's been the most useful so far, we'll go into the third and final part of the presentation where we'll look at a few of the strategies and impacts. So to finish up today, if that makes sense, let's take a look at three lessons uh, that we can draw from today's presentation, shall we? So here's the first lesson, and this is something that I flagged a year ago, um, is that big credit squeeze, big crackdown on investors, big crackdown on interest only loans. And we've seen, we've been through this period where as intended, the number of investors in the market has been squeezed and squeezed. And in fact, that's now gonna continue uh, on established property in particular, um, and that's, that's ultimately the intention of Labour's policy to push mum and dad investors out of established property. Um, the thing is, um, eventually things will stabilise and pick up again, um, but at, probably at a lower level as a share of the market than was the case than we've become used to. Uh, that's not a bad thing necessarily, because I think um, investors, in my experience, in some cases, have strayed way beyond. Um, the boundaries of traditional rental housing into, uh, well, all sorts of stuff, should we say. Uh, so it's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but it's just important to recognise now, just at the margins, uh, I think the credit uh, taps have just been loosened very slightly for investors. And there'll be opportunities too, as some landlords have spat out of the market, um, as rental yields increase, and as prices have come down. Uh, so that's the first thing to look out for. Now, the second uh, thing to watch out for is that through this cycle, um, to be blunt, mainly funded by Chinese investors from the Chinese mainland, uh, we saw a lot of, um, it, shall we say, investor style apartment stock constructed. So, this uh, not too far away uh, from where I stayed in New Farm, um, <clears throat> just up at Newstead. Uh, so, we saw a lot of that style of property constructed. Now, the number one dri driver. Uh, over more than 40 years of figures is accelerating price growth. That's what drives supply of new housing. Uh, because developers, if they believe that they can sell property and um, if people are confident enough to buy it uh, with the expectation that it will be worth at least what they paid for it at settlement, that's what drives construction. It's the certainty and rising prices. Uh, so that period is now passed. So Chinese investors have dropped off. Uh, for two reasons, there are surcharges and taxes uh, for Chinese investors now in Australia, but also capital controls in China have made it much harder for people to get their money out. Uh, super funds as well, that as a driver of new construction, they've dropped off. Um, 
Now, Labour's idea is they'll get um, developers to build new stock and they'll incentivize mum and dads to buy it. But as I've already mentioned, while some people will get sucked in, I think people will work out pretty quickly um, when valuations at settlement are coming in low uh, because um, valuers have to factor in the fact uh, that the second user of that property is not going to get the same tax benefits that has to be factored into the valuation. Um, we're going to see that um, any impact on supply from mum and dad investors in new housing it's going to be pretty muted and it's going to uh, it's not going to offset the massive downturn in construction levels that's already happening in the pipeline um so uh, the supply of new rental property is now going to constrain uh, be constricted um so uh, that's um, something to watch out for and just uh, let's have a look at the next slide as well and just to reiterate this point this is already happening so in sydney in particular the pipeline is now shrinking very fast in Brisbane, it already started in 2016. I think in Melbourne, um, the population growth in Melbourne is so strong, 120 odd thousand plus per annum. Uh, you might find that there's enough demand for housing that uh, construction holds up at a reasonable level. Um, but supply is already tightening and that's going to continue for as long as there's pressure on prices. Um, Developers just aren't going to be confident in, uh, enough to build. Um, and I'm not just talking about building approvals here. I'm talking about projects being mothballed, abandoned, cancelled, developers going bust, insolvencies. Um, so um, it's not just the approvals numbers, although they tell their own story. It's just that uh, the pipeline of new housing now is shrinking pretty quickly and much quicker, in fact, than some of the um, uh, bureau's statistics might imply because a lot of those apartments will never make it to the market at all. What we've seen in recent years, I've just taken Brisbane as a, a case study here, but in certain areas like in uh, West End and South Brisbane and the Gabba and the CBD, and we already mentioned um, Newstead and Fortitude Valley, lots of, um, lots of high rise apartments being constructed. Um, developers managed to finance those largely through the sale of property to offshore investors that's now stopped um super funds are no longer buying new properties by and large uh, mum and dad investors um they're going to be spooked away because um who's going to uh, sign a contract to buy an off the plan property with no certainty over what that property will be worth a year or two or three years from now nobody effectively so uh, new apartment sales have dried up um and Regardless of Labour's policy, that's the dynamic we're now seeing. So in, in Brisbane, uh, vacancy rates have been falling for about six months. I think uh, Melbourne might shock a few people with how quickly the rental supply tightens. Um, it's already happened in Tasmania. Adelaide is now following. So all over the country, fewer investors is leading to tightening vacancy rates. Uh, the last place uh, to experience that will be Sydney because it still has an overhang of properties under construction, largely the ones that were bought um, by offshore investors um, a couple of years back or three years ago. Uh, so it takes time for Sydney to work through that stock. But eventually, that's where we're going to get to um, as population growth is tracking at about 400,000 per annum. So it doesn't take too long at that rate of population growth before there's pressure on rents again. So this is a uh, slide I actually put up in a Prezzo last year, where I said, well, look, at the end of the day, we've still got four, four major banks. We've got non-banks as well. Uh, we've got second tier banks competing for market share. My view was we wouldn't see a credit crunch, we'd just see a credit squeeze. Uh, so what did happen? Um, the Royal Commission actually um, turned a relatively benign credit squeeze into something more significant. Uh, because banks um, all but went on strike in the second half of 2018. Very, very nervous lenders, far too uh, concerned about ticking uh, every box of an application, line by line analysis of expenses. Uh, and it pretty much um, uh, dried up the uh, flow of credit in the economy. And a modern economy, credit is the lifeblood of activity, it's lifeblood of the economy. So. And we're not just talking about housing loans. Uh, we've got personal credit growth now, lowest level since the financial crisis. 
we've seen um, small business loans have dried up, uh, residential mortgages have dropped uh, dramatically. Um, so uh, the risks have increased. So what I believe is that we'll start to see in 2019 is banks, in fact, AMZ already came out and said it last week, our lending standards have been too tight. Um, people are just too fearful of even writing a mortgage. Uh, so we might just see a, few, a bit of tapping on the shoulder and uh, uh, the regulators saying, uh, the Council of Financial Regulators actually between them, just saying to banks, um, the point has been made and taken, but at the margin, uh, things might just loosen up a bit. Uh, but a caveat to that is that borrowing capacity for a lot of people has come down quite significantly. Um, so yes, lenders are going to keep lending, uh, but the landscape has changed quite a lot. And this is something uh, that you need to have some awareness of. And so uh, this is just following on from the previous uh, slide. Now, I need to update my chart into 2019. But what, what we've seen is that um, after a period of very strong mortgage growth, uh, the rate of credit growth has actually slowed down for housing. Uh, it's about just over 4%. So it's pretty, pretty low, uh, cyclical lows now. Um, uh, but the, the thing uh, to take away from this is that uh, mortgage um, debt has increased significantly over the years, and that's going to continue. Um, but yeah, we've been through now a period of a couple of years where uh, there's it, the um, credit squeeze has made it harder and harder for people to borrow and for banks to lend. Uh, but we're probably coming out the other side of that now. Now, something else to remember is that with all of this going on in the background, um, the thing that still drives property prices in the end is supply and demand, and those things haven't changed. So always remember that demographics are destiny, and that's what drives demand for real estate. So population, 400,000 per annum, is mainly going into Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane in that order. Uh, Brisbane's seen its fourth consecutive year of population increase, uh, so things are steadily tightening there. Melbourne has rampant population growth. Uh, Sydney still growing at about 95,000 per annum, about 5.3 million people and heading towards six. Uh, so there are some predictable trends. So uh, uh, pressure on land uh, values has continued. Um, there are certain areas where the demand for housing will be very strong. So in particular, uh, popular school zones for state high schools and some private schools. Um, you know, so for the right type of property, uh, families will still uh, pay almost any price. So there are some things that will continue. And as I already mentioned, the supply of new housing is now going to uh, actually drop off. So uh, although the tax rules will change 1 January 2020, it's also important to remember that the fundamentals that underpin the housing market, they haven't, all, they haven't changed overnight. And in fact, over the next a uh, few decades, we'll see the population increase from about 25 to 40 million. So there'll still be a lot of demand for housing. In fact, a huge demand for housing. So um, again, uh, my chart needs updating. But what we're seeing at this point in the cycle, in fact, what you always see at this point in the cycle is people moving away from the expensive cities uh, towards southeast Queensland. So Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast and Brisbane. Um, interstate migration to Queensland is at a 10-year high. Um, we haven't got the mining boom this time around, uh, but certainly the pull factor there of a better lifestyle, affordability and a better climate. Um, we've seen a lot of um, focus on southeast Queensland at this point in the cycle. Another point that very rarely gets mentioned, and is something I always watch from the census numbers and from the annual figures from the Bureau, is how we've got this enormous surge of people coming into the first home buyer age, which I think um, uh, these days is in the sort of early to mid 30s. Um, so Australia's um, immigration program is very, um, very much been targeted towards the under 30s. So people like myself come to Australia when they're in their 20s, coming into their peak earning years and um, coming into that time of their life when they start to add to demand for housing. Um, now, this hasn't really received all that much in the way of coverage. If you look at the stats year on year, there's a huge surge of people coming into the first time by age. I mean, truly unprecedented for Australia. So it's one of the things to remember that while changes um, and investors will amplify the cycle, um, 
the underlying demand for owner-occupied housing, um, particularly for, for young migrants, especially in the inner suburbs of Sydney, Melbourne, and to a secondary extent, Brisbane, uh, there's a huge demand. Uh, it's the demographic tsunami. Uh, so people will be taken aback by this, but the numbers uh, uh, tell their own story on that. As already mentioned, uh, demand for housing tends to uh, very often follow key school zones, and that's becoming uh, increasingly important as the population becomes more dense and there's more, pop uh, more pressure on schools and um, the number of people wanting to go to those schools. Uh, so that's a very predictable trend. Um, it's, uh, the trends have changed a little bit. Um, and uh, here I've taken the example of Brisbane, but you're quite often seeing um, that, that there's Asian capital coming in from overseas and internally, and it's putting a lot of pressure on land values in certain school zones. So that's a really predictable trend um, for people who want to outperform. And we already mentioned um, the possibility of people looking at other income streams. So whether that's from a business or whether it's from the stock market or from other sources uh, such as commercial property, uh, people do need to balance up. Um, in the end, where is their passive income going to come from? Because I'm here to tell you that residential property on its own uh, won't get you there. Um, Resi property has been really good for people building equity uh, because of the leverage that they can use. But in terms of passive income on its own, it won't get you there. So you've got two choices. You can learn the slow way by trial and error, or you can learn the fast way. Uh, so as I mentioned, we've been through all this uh, before in Britain. We had changes to deductibility. Uh, there was behavioral change and people adjusted course. Uh, but you can get on the front foot and position yourself correctly now and you'll thank yourself in 10 years time so to finish up then i'm just going to talk for about 20 seconds per slide on the solution that i've built and then we'll wrap it up with your free download at the end i just want to say a big thank you to uh, the guys at riskwise property research because i'll be honest i didn't have a very good handle on a lot of this stuff until uh, they very kindly gave me access to their modeling. And I was totally blown away by that uh, because as, to the best of my knowledge, they're the only people who've done uh, in-depth modeling on housing markets across all of the SA4 regions. They've looked at different property types and all of the, the different impacts. Um, so uh, I'm very, very grateful to uh, Doron and the team for giving me those insights uh, because it's now given me the edge in terms of understanding impact of Labour's changes. Um, so I strongly recommend uh, you follow those guys at RiskWise, because um, as far as I'm aware, they're the only people who've really modelled this stuff in any kind of depth. And um, what they showed me is that some areas of Australia are going to get absolutely clobbered uh, by Labour's changes. Um, they, a lot of the reviews that you see have done sort of at the macro level, you know, Australia this and uh, you know, house prices that. Uh, which is, uh, that's fine if you've only got a cigarette packet to do your calcs, but for an individual, you need to understand what are the impacts on you and your portfolio and actually how are you going to position yourself going forward. Uh, so um, big kudos to the guys at RiskWise, market leaders in this space. And um, thank you for giving me some statistical support for some of the ideas which I had in my head, but I didn't have any basis for, so thank you. So here's why I built this solution. One of the things that I uh, came to understand, uh, particularly from uh, the research of RiskWise, is that investors now amplify the cycle. So there's always an underlying demand for housing, as I mentioned, from home buyers and owner occupiers and first time buyers and so on. But what actually amplifies the cycle these days is the number of investors as they come and go through the cycles so that impacts option clearance rates, it impacts new supply, impacts prices and um, that's why it's so important to understand investor trends um, now this cycle is a little bit different from previous ones it's been brought to an end not by interest rate heights as such although there was some tweaking in the mortgage rate differential but it's been brought to an end by firstly a credit squeeze and then a royal commission and now uh, we'll see changes and to uh, tax incentives as well. So this cycle is very different. And I'm a bit concerned, now I'm very concerned, shall we say, uh, that some people 
Um, because in the end, people will do what they get paid for. That's what they'll recommend. So a lot of people are going to recommend uh, the same old, same old. Uh, what I'm saying to people is uh, you want to be very careful about just doing what you've always done because the landscape has changed. So you need to think pretty carefully about your situation and be wary of people giving you advice that suits them rather than you. So here's what I do uh, in my programs. I build a mothership. So look at where people are at today with their assets and their liabilities, um, their business or their career. And I work out where they want to get to um, over a 10 or 15 year time horizon. And then the missing piece of the puzzle is to work out well, how do you get from A to B in the most efficient and effective strategy uh, possible. Um, so what my solution does, it gives people the confidence um, as well as um, the uh, decisiveness to make the right decisions. Um, I've put on my little slide here motivation, but one of the things I've found is that almost all of my clients are already highly motivated. They don't really need much um, in terms of motivation. I can see from the results they've achieved, achieved to date, they're already motivated. What they actually need is just the confidence to make decisive um, strategies and put them into action. And um, that way you can track the results and you can see yourself going from A to B. So a special offer for today. Thanks for watching the workshop. Um, for uh, people who've uh, watched to this point, there's a free 15 minute diagnosis call. Uh, so get in contact by the website. It's go nextlevelwealth.com.au. And for successful applicants, I do a 45 minute strategy session in Sydney, Melbourne or Brisbane uh, when I'm in those cities uh, and it's first come first served. Uh, so get in contact by the website. So what I do with my diagnosis, I just help people to set some far more specific goals and then the strategies um, that will get you to those goals or they drop out at the end of it. The most important thing is to work out where do you want to get to and by when and then the strategies will almost write themselves. So I find where I add a lot of my value is in one-to-one -one sessions. So I do half-day workshops in the office. Um, it's a case-by-case -case basis, so my solution is tailored, and that's where I find um, I offer a lot of my um, best value uh, because everybody's circumstances are different. Now, the reason I do 12-month programs is that 12 months is long enough uh, for us to set some goals for people to kick off with their new strategies and we can track the progress uh, through the year see what's working and also uh, gives me the opportunity to hold people accountable over the full 12 months as well so as i say it's not a one size fits all uh, because everybody's at a different stage in their journey and um, certainly the strategies under the new tax rules are going to be pretty different for people who are uh, within 10 years of their retirement, for example, uh, be very different from the strategies that would be used by a first timer or somebody nearer the beginning of their journey. Uh, so it's a tailored solution and there's no one size fits all. So the full price of my 12 month program, uh, as you can imagine for a full year of one-to-one -one coaching is not cheap, uh, but for people who've tuned in today, uh, there's a free 15 minute diagnosis call and for first come, first served on a limited intake basis, a free 45 minute strategy session as well. Now, of course, I do understand that 12 months is a big commitment on both sides. Um, so what I do offer with my programs is a full money back guarantee for the first 30 days. Uh, so if it's not working for any reason, uh, there's a full money back guarantee and we can leave as friends. Uh, so that just helps people to get over that hurdle and to um, commit for a full 12 months program. So this is a better than great deal, a special offer for today, free 15 minute diagnosis call and on a uh, first come, first serve basis for successful applicants, a free session too. So you can't say better than that. It's go nextlevelwealth.com.au, check out the website. And everybody says these days that they've got a limited intake, uh, but in this case, it is literally true because it is just me doing one-to-one -one coaching. Uh, so it's first come, first served and get in contact today. And don't forget to download your free book as well um, at the website go nextlevelwealth.com.au. 
And that is it for today. Thanks for watching. Um, so as I mentioned, there's lots of doom and gloom out there in the media. Uh, there are some risks, I think, for people who um, yeah, press on with the blinkers on. Um, and if you've got some dud assets, you might need to think about having a portfolio restructure. But on the other hand, um, things actually are already rebalancing in some ways. And there'll be some opportunities too. Uh, but you probably just need to change course if you want to uh, not just survive over the next decade in real estate, but actually thrive. Um, so that's a brief summary for today. Uh, download the book and um, be in touch. Cheers. So that's the end of the presentation then. Uh, don't forget to download your free book at the website, go nextlevelwealth.com.au. And get in contact via the website, it's go nextlevelwealth.com.au. Cheers.